Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, three orders of thanks. I think for that what he said was good. <laughs> and, um, no, but I want to thank you uh, to the Institute for having me for this august occasion. It's a very uh, wonderful thing. For, I wanted to come here for a long time, and I'm glad to have an opportunity to be here. Second, I want to say, if I may, uh, thank you for allowing me to lecture in my language in your country. That speaks well of you and poorly of me. In most parts of Europe, I'll be fine, but if I've come this far over, I'm hopeless. And so uh, I'm very grateful to you for allowing me to speak in English. And if you, by the way, if you can't hear me in the back, just let me know. Um, finally, a special personal thanks to Pavel Glebrich, whose work I've admired for so very long and from whom I've learned so much through the years. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to renew our acquaintance here now. Okay, I'll start um, a little bit far, this the subtitle is called Aristotle's Cognized Goodness, but we'll start a little far away, so Paul outfitted me with this, I think there'll be no stopping me now, this is quite a wonderful little device, I've never used one before. Anyway, um, we'll start pretty far from Aristotle with Tolstoy in Anna Karenina. Tolstoy, in the character of Levin, has this claim which intrigued me the last time I reread the novel, if goodness has causes, it is not goodness, he says. If it has effects, a reward, it's not goodness either. So goodness is outside the chain of cause and effect. So goodness is outside the chain of cause and effect. And I wonder, so why we might think that? And there's a wrangle of worries. Um, perhaps goodness, he thinks, would just be somehow sullied or smudged by its association with causation. Um, it might be thought derivative or dependent, and so insufficiently complete or perfect or autonomous if goodness was good because it was related to something else in a certain way. Uh, perhaps he thinks that goodness would be adulterated by its bringing about effects. That's what the actual quotation seems to me to suggest. Uh, he says it might in particular, he says, if it were reward, if, if goodness were reward, it wouldn't be goodness. And so I think the thought might there be good, you know, doing something because it's good would be doing it because it's a prize. And so it would become crassly prudential rather than good to do something. And um, so maybe it stands aloof from the causal nexus. This view has a modern metaphysical analog. And the um, person I'm going to mention, this is the great Graham Audie, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, with a book called Value, Reality, and Desire, he says, uh, even if one granted that there are facts about value, we just don't have a causal story to tell about how desires track values, because that would require values to be active constituents of the causal network. Now, Audie himself thinks he has a solution to this, but his way of putting the problem seems to me to be a quite reasonable thought. We don't understand how goodness could be in the causal network as a normative fact. This modern metaphysical worry he then develops a little bit. And the reason we don't have such a story is that there couldn't be one. Again, this is not his final view. It's him setting the problem. Uh, given something we have already conceded, the supervenience of value and the natural. So you have the natural world, and once the microphysical structure of the universe is set, all the value properties are set. So this is a sort of picture that pervades a lot of contemporary metaphysics. Once the atoms are all distributed, everything else is determined all the way up, including value facts if there are any. Uh, so the super value facts supervene on natural facts, and given supervenience, determination without reducibility, we can prove the impotence of values, a proof which parallels familiar exclusion arguments from the philosophy of mind. So the idea here, we won't rehearse them right now, but those of you who know the relevant literatures in philosophy of mind, the idea is once all the neurophysiological features are set, then there's nothing more to be said about the psychological and the normative and beliefs and desires and hopes and wishes. The world is chugging along at the physical level and the normative level which is supervening is left dangling. This is a picture. And it contributes nothing or nothing which isn't already contributed by the causal structure of the physical or natural world. So goodness would then be in the way that in the philosophy of mind facts about mentality are left dangling would be left dangling if it were supervening, because it's not reduced to, it's not part of the natural world, it's not part of the causal nexus, so it might be sort of carried along, piggybacking on the causal nexus, but not itself having any kind of autonomous causal oomph or push. 
So this modern metaphysical worry I'm going to claim in today's lecture is already in Aristotle and is already a proposed kind of solution in Aristotle and is one that I myself accept with certain provisions, provisos. One, so Aristotle himself makes two common complaints about the good and they're mainly targeted on his teacher Plato. One is if there was such a thing as the form of the good as Plato, so Plato famous says in the, in the Republic, there is this thing called the form of the good. It's somehow first among forms. It's the last thing we learn when we're being educated. And it surpasses even being a dignity and power. And he says, yeah, yeah, whatever, says Aristotle. It, even if there were such a thing, it would be irrelevant to human action. And uh, if it's separated, and it's, it's therefore causally impotent. And this is just exactly what Audi seems to be saying so many years later. And so isolated from the inculcation of goodness in our daily Congress. If it were, so Aristotle has this common complaint. Plato thinks that the forms exist anti-rem, before, or somehow independent of, separate from the natural world, before in various senses, maybe not temporal so much as logical or metaphysically or something, prior to. And um, what will that have to do with our lives? The first point about irrelevance. So I won't read this whole thing, but he says, look, you might have knowledge of the goods, and you might want to know, gee, if the, so he has this view, Plato says, goodness is like a pattern, and we're trying to pattern ourselves after it. And then Aristotle says, yeah, that has some plausibility, that argument of Plato's, that the goodness is, so I, I want to say there's something right about that, but it, it doesn't really clash, I mean, it doesn't really jive with how we get on in the world, this procedure, because no one, he says, looks to the idea of the good, no craftsman, no carpenter, no technician, nobody says, oh, I should think about the good before I build my table. I should just, uh, it's irrelevant. <coughs> no doctor, he says, looks about, looks to the good, but thinks about health. And not just healthy, not even health in general. The doctor's looking about the health of this particular, this particular man right now, today. That's my goal. And goodness has nothing to do with it at all. On the cause for impotence point, now we're going to get a little bit of attention. Aristotle says, presumably he's talking about Plato and others, among the wise, some used to think that beyond the many good things in the world, right, beyond health and beyond some beautiful paintings and beyond a certain amount of wealth or whatever, um, beyond all those good things, there is some other good, something good in its own right, which I'll translate as per se from Greek, ta 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 ta. This basically means taken all by itself or something like that. So goodness just taken all by itself. Um, which is the cause, the aition, of the goodness of all these good things. People used to think that the goodness was a cause, but um, we're giving up on that because they make two missteps. They think there's something good in its own right, beyond or distinct from the many good things out there just by itself, goodness, as opposed to a good F, a, a good meal, a good rendition of an aria, uh, a, a good deed. Uh, a good job. I mean, it, all those things are good, but there isn't the other thing, just goodness. And um, second, goodness is not or cannot be a cause of generation or alteration. So now we're getting closer to the Adi style worry. Um, goodness can't be, um, so, and there's the sort of two claims here. One is that, sorry, goodness is a cause or it's the cause. So maybe goodness, and this is going to matter for the talk today, Sometimes you seem to be complaining, goodness is causally inert, causally impotent, you can't do anything, it's a form, if there are forms, then they're abstract objects, and they're outside the causal nexus. Sometimes you seem to be saying, rather, that goodness can't by itself be the cause of anything, it can't be like it, a single cause, because as a single cause, it would uh, be all by itself, and it's got to be somehow integrated with something else. And this is the thought that Aristotle himself is going to urge. So these complaints seem to me that could be taken severally, individually that is, or corporately. On the one hand, he might be saying, perhaps it's wrong to think of goodness as beyond good things. So it's just, and there's a famous paper by Peter Geach, for those of you who know this literature, there's no such thing as, he says, you know, predictive goodness, X is good, Y is good, Z is good. There's only being a good F or a good G or a good H. There's being a good doctor or a good thief or you know, a, a, good, a good sister or whatever. All these things are, but there's no just 
being good. Everything, is, everything which is good is a good something or other, and good is therefore is descriptive. So this is the sort of picture that there's nothing beyond all the good things. So it's wrong to think of goodness as the cause of the goodness of good things. It gets the story backwards. Corporately, taking those two words together, it's wrong to think of goodness as a cause of goodness of good things, when and only when, or even because, goodness is conceived as something beyond the good things whose goodness it putatively causes. So it's like you take the goodness out of things and reify it and make it its own thing, then it's not going to be the role to be a cause of the things that are actually good. And that's what Aristotle seems to be, in these passages, suggesting. It's surprising, therefore, to me at least, then, that Aristotle himself says this. We find, after all, that goodness can cause the good for human beings and human flourishing. Eudaimonia is held by Aristotle to be a cause of goodness. Here's what he says. But it's clear to us from what has been said that happiness is among the honored and the complete things. This seems also to be so because it is a principle, an arcade. So it's a source. For it's the it's for the sake of this that we do all that we do, and because the principle it, 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 and cause of goods, we claim something honored and divine. So he says there is something, and there is something which is good, and it's a cause, and we honor it as a cause. As I said, Plato and Republic identifies the good as that which every soul pursues, and that on account of which it does all that it does. Aristotle says that the principle is for the sake of this that we do all that we do. It sounds like <laughs> it's almost right out of the Republic. I mean, we, everything we do, we do for the sake of the good, the, and which causes us to do the good things that we do. So there's some weirdness here when Aristotle is dumping on Plato, and in a famous passage in Nicomachean Ethics, he spends the whole chapter just saying uh, argument after argument after argument how the formula of good is pointless. One of the arguments I earlier was from that chapter. It's somehow impossible for there to be such a thing. It's impossible for it to be separate. It's impossible for it to be one thing. And so we have a tension in Aristotle. Not a contradiction. I don't think he hasn't contradicted himself, but there's a tension saying that goodness can't be a cause and then saying that goodness is a cause of a certain kind. The good can't be a cause. The good for humans is a cause, and indeed it's <laughs> the cause for which we do all the good things that we do. How is Aristotle's going to cause what Plato's is not and cannot be? That's the question I want to answer today. And Plato, there are two perfectly, what I'll call ideal reasons, according to Aristotle, why Plato's form of the good, if there is a form of the good, can't be a cause. First, we can follow Aristotle in distinguishing, so suppose there are forms. What are forms? Well. Let's just say they're abstract mind and language independent entities which have all their intrinsic properties essentially, which are what they are, permanently, perfectly, ceaselessly, unchanging, existing as paradigms for us to look toward as normative constraints on how we proceed. Those things, those abstract entities, now this talk about abstract entities, by the way, this is of course not Plato's lingo, it's not Aristotle's lingo. But Plato will talk about the perceptibles and the non-perceptibles. And the non-perceptibles are the things which are knowables, they are no eta. Those are the things I'm calling, in our terms, abstract. They're not things which are, in principle, capable of perception. So, so the ideal attributes of those things are they have in virtue of their being forms. Proper attributes are attributes given form that it has in virtue of being the form it is. I mean by that, for example, ideal. Every form is intelligible, it's immutable, it's abstract, it's eternal, it's universal, in some sense of the term universal, just in virtue of being a form. And then there are the proper attributes of forms, it's a bit trickier, but some form phi will have the feature of being paradigmatically phi. So the form of beauty, if there is such a form, will be paradigmatically beautiful. And the form of equality, if there is such a form, will be paradigmatically equal. And the form of justice, if there is such a form, will be paradigmatically just. But the form of equality won't be paradigmatically just. <laughs> yeah, it's, so, so, so the proper attributes are those that attend to the forms being the kinds of forms, the individual forms they are. The ideal are those they have just by dint of being a form at all. So then there are two ideal reasons that Plato, uh, Aristotle seems to be, he seems to focus on in his complaints. First, forms are quite generally, generically, uh, sorry, genetically, uh, causally impotent, he says many other times, and forms don't jive with phenomena. 
Namely, we observe things becoming good and bad, and the form of good will always there being a cause, things would just be caused to be good all the while. So this is a common complaint of Aristotle's, that if there were these forms, they're just there shining their causal power, and yet <laughs> they're not always operative. So how could, they, how could they turn off and on if they're just always there, eternally, immutably, exercising what they do? I mean, Neoplatonists later had various answers to this kind of worry, but you can see why one might have it. So the generic causal imp impotence is this. You might question whether the forms contribute, what they contribute to sensible things, whether those they are separatornal, they come into being, and so forth. They help not at all regarding the knowledge of other things or regarding their being, given that they are not present to the particulars which share in them. So if they were present to them, everything which, you know, if justice were making things just, the things that could be just always would be just, but they're not. I could be just, but I'm not. Okay? Or, you know, a society, this society or that society. America could be just, but it's not. And if justice were present and it were the kind of thing which could in principle be just, it would be just. But that's obviously not our experience of the world, says Aristotle. And this point about intermittent generation that I just mentioned. If the forms are causes, why is that their generating activity, why is it intermittent instead of perpetual and continuous, since there always are participants as well as forms? Besides, in some instances we behold some other cause. For it's the doctor who implants health, and the knower, the teacher, who implants knowledge. Though health itself and knowledge itself are the participants and similarly concerning other things falling under capacity. So just look at the world. It's not health itself which is making anybody healthy. It's a doctor. Okay? Uh, it's, not, it's not knowledge which is making people know. It's a teacher. So there's always some particular local agent. And he says, so these, the, these things fall by the wayside in the causal nexus. Those are the two ideal reasons. Yet, now, so, so now we see Aristotle say, well, okay, Plato's wrong, let's say. It can't be this good which is causally operative because it would be permanently and not intermittently operative. And it, we would see somehow, we'd be aware of it, but we've seen, you know, Carpenter looks at it and we don't see it, the good, making a table or causing anything to be good. What we see is agents. But yet Aristotle has this thought. Okay, he's worried. That's, I think we all should be worried. Namely, so we have the natural world, the world that Audi was talking about as the subvenient base of the normative world. The question is, where do, how do things get going? How, how, how does motion in the world get going unless it's always there? How do things start to go is what he's really worried about. And Aristotle has this claim. What initiates motion, now, there's a, a, a sort of textual question about how broad this is. He's just talking about human motion or motion in general. There's some analogs to this in his discussions in the middle, low, a little bit, but also in metaphysics lambda. And, but what initiates motion is always an object of desire. But this is either good or the apparent good. Not every good, but the good concerned with what can be done. That little writer is a proviso because he wants to say, there's a sense in which a mathematical <coughs> proof is good, and it's a permanent thing, and we discover it, and that's good, but it's not something you can do. You can't bring about the proofs being true. You can discover the proof. But you can bring about changes in the world. You can bring it about that you go to the store. Um, you can you cascade your body down the road. Since what is done, the practice, is what's contingent and can be otherwise. So there are things which are permanently fixed, which we can't do because they're just there. It's like, I can't do, I can't make it the case that seven is greater than five. It's just a fact. So it's not among the things which can be done. And it's necessary, it can't be otherwise. But things which can be otherwise are things that we can do. And so in that domain, the things which can be done are done exclusively because they are desired. And we have an early corroboration of this kind of view in Theophrastus, in the periproton. So he says, the source, so this question, the, the source of being of this sort, if indeed it connects with perceptibles, so nature, and nature is, generally speaking, in motion, and this is its peculiar feature, its idiom. And it is clear that one must posit this as the cause of motion. 
But since motionlessness in its own right, it is clear that it would not be the cause of the motion of things in nature by being in motion, and that this is left to some greater and prior power. But the nature, but that the nature of the object of desire, the, the nature of the object of desire is of this sort, from that which is circular and continuous. So he's taking the, the point about human desire and now putting it into a cosmic analog um, and saying the ceaseless motion originates of the heavens, that is, so that one could in this way resolve the difficulty of there being no source of motion without something being in motion, initiating motion. Namely, it's being of the nature of an object of desire to initiate motion. And that's the end of the explanation. A natural thought. Goodness causes by coinciding with other causally efficacious qualities. Now I'm going to get slightly more technical than I've been so far. So um, this is the point where Aristotle now gets fine-grained and intentional. Goodness is, you might think, oh, I get it. So it's not that goodness causes by itself, it causes by coinciding with an object of desire, like a delicious meal, or like a walk in the park. Um, I went to this big Dichka yesterday. I think it's the most beautiful place in Europe I've ever seen. I think, okay, I want to go back there, so I have this desire. It's there, as it were, <laughs> drawing you back toward it. And you say, well, why is it an object of desire? Well, because it's somehow beautiful or tranquil or, uh, you know, pleasing or maybe it gives me pleasure. There's a whole bunch of different things you might be saying here, but the, all those things, it's good, it's being good would be coinciding with it's being an object of desire. So maybe, the, oh, I see how goodness causes. It coincides with so, something which is independently specifiable as, desi as uh, desirable. So X is being good is the cause of Y's being fee, or if someone's doing something, something's being good, or someone's doing some action, um, only if, in addition to being good, it's also C. And C suffices for Y's being fee, or S is doing this action A. So th let's just be dumb about it. Okay. Uh, the reason that I'm eating a piece of cake, it's why is the cake good? Because it's sweet. And it's being sweet is the thing which is doing the causal work here. It suffices for my wanting to eat the cake. Being good just is something which overlaps. Sweetness is good. That's the claim. And, but it's the sweetness which is carrying the causal oomph here. So we're sort of back in the, where we were at the beginning. In Aristotle's idiom, and this is the way he speaks about it, X is being good is a cause of Y is being phi or of S is doing A or alpha. Only if X is being good is something coinciding. He uses the word Cottest and Bibbit cost. This comes into Latin for those of you who study this stuff as per occidence. I don't like this translation, but there it is. So, something which, but to say it as two things are Cottest and Bibbit cost one, but they coincide. So, Socrates and Socrates seated. There are two things, well, there's one coinciding. That's the sort of picture here. So, the, the sweetness and so the, the being an object of desire and being good are coinciding in that sense. And C is a per se cause. So sweetness is doing the work here, or beauty is doing the work here, or profit is doing the work here, or pleasure is doing the work here, and goodness is just piggybacking, going along for the ride. So if a pizza is being good as a cause of Tamar's walking to the pizza parlor, only if there's pizza, and it's also the object, it's an erecton for Tamar, and it's being an object of desire, suffices for her walking to the pizza parlor. So you can say, oh, I see, she's pursuing the good, if you like, go ahead. But that's only kind of some baby cost. That's only because the good is coinciding with something else, namely good taste, flavor. More difficult, the, the goodness of happiness, eudaimonia, is a cause of health as being good. So why, so why do I want to be healthy? Because I want to be happy. <coughs> only if eudaimonia is something desirable and being an object of desire, it suffices for health as being something so it's health I want, not goodness. It's happiness I want, not goodness. Although those are good things. They coincide with the good, but I don't want them. And here comes a crucial word for the rest of the talk. Because, or insofar, or in virtue of, or qua, being good. You think it gets the explanation backwards. I want... He says, yeah, it's not that 
I want health because it's good. It's good because it's health. <laughs> and that's what I want, health. Surprisingly, Aristotle rejects this view twice, twice over. So now we get to the nuance of his view. Or well, if I'm right, I mean, this is my claim. Well, goodness of cause only coincidentally comes to be the cause, parakidens, whatever, when something else causes. So before I, I translate this per se, it's just easy to put per se there. In its own right, I translated it earlier, something like all by itself or taken all by itself. Um, but you kind of lose that you know, in, in the Latinate per se through itself, okay, in its own right, by itself, with nothing else in the mix is what he's after. And it produces, then goodness may prove to be causally irrelevant. So, look, I know this woman. She gives some money each month to charity. She says, take out 10 US dollars out of my paycheck every month to give to the Catholic charity, say. Why does she do that? Well, she might do it because she thinks giving to charity will alleviate world hunger, and she wishes to alleviate world hunger. She thinks it would be a good thing if world hunger were alleviated. Um, but um, you might think, then, well, goodness isn't doing it. It's world hunger that she wants to get rid of. But what we don't know, and here's the, here comes the crucial Aristotelian insight, is why she wants to get rid of world hunger. It might be because she thinks it's good, or it might be because she thinks that hungry people are annoying. <laughs> she walks down the street, you know, if, if you live, I moved back to the United States, if you go to Chicago, there are hungry people all over the street, and they, they are annoying. I don't mean this in a mean way, I mean one's heart goes out to them, but you can't walk down the street without being harangued on every block by poor people who are hungry, right? They're hungry, and they want food, and they want money, and they, some of them want a glass of wine, same as me, you know, it's not like, so there's a lot of judgment about all this, but, but, but you might say, I want to give some money to the charities to make these people get out of my way so I can walk down the street unhindered and just go about my day. And, and so it's not anything to do with it's being good or not. So we don't really yet know, given that she wants to alleviate hunger, whether goodness is a cause here or not. Moreover, if being good merely coincides with relieving hunger, then its causal role is no more vouchsafe than the exchange of the role in beauty in the curing of a healthy child. So why does the doctor cure the child? Maybe she's doing it for money. Maybe she's doing it because she thinks health is good. Maybe she thinks healthy children are beautiful. I do. And she wants, to, she wants more beauty in her world. So she's going to, that's, that's why she's doing it. We're naturally disposed in response to say that the charitable woman did not care to alleviate hunger just on a lark or just simply at random, but rather because the alleviation of hunger is or appears to her to be something good, and that the woman intended the charitable action in view of its goodness. And that seems fair enough to me. But then we have noticeably reintroduced goodness itself as causally salient, as a causally salient feature of the object of her desire. But that's what we're going to insist on. We're insisting upon its goodness, which is doing the role. And so we have introduced an inimitably normative feature of the object of desire as good as part of our causal explanation. And Aristotle rejects this another way. Looked at from this perspective, we may say, in a modern idiom, that even if an appeal to a coinciding cause is extensionally adequate, as far as that goes, extensional adequacy does not, in Aristotle's view, go far enough. It doesn't matter that the two things overlap, this inadequacy is twofold. However, extension adequate, they fail in the first instance to cite the causally salient feature in the cause denominated. And second, further, in so failing, they systematically um, go by ignoring what Aristotle, rightly in my view, accepts as the manifest normativity of the explanation. Now, I'm merely going to say it's annoying. I'm not yet saying anything about anything normative, but if it's annoying, to me, and uh, it would be good not to be annoyed, but then goodness is back in the picture and the normative dimension is back in again. So it's always lurking there somewhere, as a thought is. So this picture, this picture that you have of the natural world chugging along <laughs> without any normativity involved seems to be ill-equipped to explain how things are objects of desire. So in Aristotle's view, he states plainly the normative dimension of the final cause, that for the sake of which we do things, in this respect, he evidently regards as opposed to the material cause. I see the cause that Adi was calling, you know, sort of the non-normative descriptive range. 
that for the that as that for the sake of which and or i.e. the good. And this is really interesting. So he's talking about the final cause, and this is really interesting. This is a chap we don't know anything about Hemotinus of Clasomenon. He was an associate, some people think a teacher of Anaxagoras. Um, and Anaxagoras always gets high marks from Aristotle. He's the one who saw the final cause. He's always saying, yeah, he saw this and other people didn't. And Plato gives him high marks and then says, but he doesn't deliver. Um, Remarking that these thinkers were responsive to the demands of the truth itself, which makes plain that neither the material elements nor luck, lucky spontaneity could account for being well and beauty in both being and coming to be. That, again, sounds like a platonic idiom. So let me um, go. All right, this is letting down. Okay, there we go. So these guys fall short. Here's what he says. That for the sake of which actions and changes and movements take place, they call a cause in a way. These, but these people who are saying that we do it for the sake of those things. But they do not call it a cause, the, a cause, the way in which it's nature it is to be a cause. For some, speaking of new sort of love, posit these things as good. So he's thinking of the pre-Socratics. They do not speak, however, as if anything among the things that are or exist should be or comes to be for the sake of these, but say that their motions are from these. He just uses this word apo. Therefore, it turns out that in a sense they both say and do not say the good is the cause. They say something which is good is the cause, but they don't say that it's a cause insofar as it's good. For they do not call it a cause without qualification, but coincidentally, sorry, I meant to put a little red light up. They do not call it a cause hapolos, simply, without qualification, in itself, or somehow, but only coincidentally, so far it co coincides with something else. So his complaint seems to be that where C is a cause, or an aition of E, we fail the test of explanatory adequacy in citing C, and thus we also cite some feature of phi, in virtue of which it's an aition, or a cause of E, and further that we do so in an intentionally sensitive manner, i.e picking out the salient causal feature, which is the one actually doing the driving of the causal exchange. Alert to discriminations of the existence of causes, which are causes coincidentally. For those of you who do contemporary philosophy of mind, this is like the inverse of Donald Davidson's anomalous monism. The, you know, he, he tries to exploit the extensionality, the coextensionality of the mental and the physical. I just want to say that, that won't get you to a proper explanation until you get to the actual feature in virtue of which, and unsurprisingly, for those of you who know the literature, that's what Davidson was pilloried for for two decades, saying your, the, the mental causes you're citing here are causally irrelevant. And as applied to goodness, then, Aristotle's complaint comes to just this, according to me. There is some good C, qualifies as a cause of some E, including an action, only if the goodness of C in that cause figures inimitably in the causal production of E's being or becoming C and does so by a discrete causal pathway, one that is not merely piggybacking or, in the modern legal, supervening on the formal, <coughs> natural, or efficient pathway. So it won't be, he says, enough for an Anaxagoras to cite the cause as something good unless he says, in addition, the cause is the cause it is because it's good. The good must cause, he thinks, non-coincidentally, kathauta, per se, in its own right, because it's good. So after all, the good is a cause. So we start with this tension, but it turns out that he's not complaining about the good being a cause. He's complaining about the good not being a cause in the right sort of way, that the explanation is given were too coarse grained. And the science uncovering that for the sake of which each thing must be is the most authoritative of sciences and the more authoritative than any ancillary science. And this is the good in each class and generally the whole of nature, the best good. From all that has been said then, the name being sought falls to the same science. It must be a science able to investigate the first principles and causes of being, but the good i.e. that for the sake of which is one of the causes. That for the sake of which is one of the causes operative in nature. And so I'll close by giving a slightly 
non-standard derivation of how I understand Aristotle's take on the formal cause. The general schema here is that, so S does some action in order to feed, in order to attain some good, let's say, or first attempt is inflationary. S does A in order to feed if and only if S does A because S is doing contributes to um, feeing. That can't be right. It's like, you know, um, I don't, you know, I don't, my heart doesn't beat in order to circulate blood. I mean, it doesn't, I'm sorry, it does, but it doesn't beat in order to make the noise it makes because it does make a noise, but that doesn't contribute to anything that I do or to, it doesn't, it's making a noise that's neither here nor there. It's inert with respect to my flourishing. So the heart pumps blood in order to circulate the body, sorry, sorry, the blood in the body, I should say, I beg your pardon, if and only if the heart pumps blood because pumping blood oxygenates the body. But then, again, and here's my counterexample, a ball falls accidentally down a drain and it blocks the drain, thereby creating pressure which holds the water coming down in place. But we wouldn't say, so it's contributing to the, the sinks getting backed up, <laughs> okay, but no one would want to say that blocks the sink in order to fill up the sink. It does contribute to the sink's overfilling and flooding. But it's not for the sake of that. The ball's pressure does it, not in order to do anything at all. So we need a more fine-grained account. Aristotle wants to add normativity twice over to get the final calls in. First we say, if S does A, if and only if S does A such that it's doing contributes to its feeing, so I do A in order to fee only if my doing A contributes to its feeing, and it's actually good for me. Or, I'm going to put a little major qualification here, it won't matter, it's a phenomenon, Agathon, it's a, an appearing good. But let's just get rid of the appearance part for a moment. So Sandra swims in order to be healthy, if and only if her swimming contributes to her being healthy, and being healthy is good for Sandra, or at least appears good. That's, what it, that's why she swims in order to be healthy. But then again, she might swim in order to humiliate her enemies. She's very fit, and her friends aren't so fit. And she likes to humiliate them by parading her fitness over their lack of fitness. She's vain, vainglorious, and mean-spirited. So I don't want to say that it is true. It contributes to being healthy, and being healthy is good for her. But I can't say that she swims. <laughs> Those two things are met, but the left hand isn't satisfied because she's not swimming in order to be healthy. She's swimming in order to humiliate her enemies. So again, something's missing in our account of final causation, says Aristotle. What we need is S does order, or something closer to phi, if and only if S does A, such that S is doing contributes to feeing, or so to being healthy. Feeing is good for S, and so norm involving, that was the first part of the talk, and does so, it's the second part of the talk, because, or in virtue of feeing's being good for S. That's got to be the salient causal pathway which secures doing something for the sake of something. That's what I call hyperintentional final causation, which is to say Aristotelian te teleology. Yet evidently, that kind of hyperintentionality is operative only in cognition. This is where the subtitle was. So I, I could be wrong about this. If I'm wrong about this, it seems when we had that little claim in De Anima, the, the something desiderative, you know, initiates motion only as desiderative because it's good or an apparent good. And that seemed to be what Theophrastus was saying as well. So too, Aristotle himself in the passages I read you and these other passages I'll mention. And a favorite Aristotelian of mine much closer to her own time, comes right out and says it in the most straightforward way. This is Francisco Suarez, a neo-Aristotelian, or Aristotelian, whatever, um, in the so-called second scholastic in the Iberian Peninsula. I say first, Dico Primo, <laughs> I like this guy. So, um, in order for an end to cause, it is altogether necessary that it be cognized in advance. Nothing can be a final cause unless it is cognized in advance which seems already, if you, those of you who study the history of science, you might think it's a massive concession in a way to the thought that the natural world has no final causation in it. On the other hand, 
thinks, what could be more natural <laughs> than a person desiring a pizza? The natural world is outfitted with agents capable of intentionality, capable of desiring, and capable of cognizing things as good or as apparently so. Hence, we get the final account. S does some action A in order to phi, if not only if she does phi such that her doing phi contributes to phiing, to it's good or an apparent good for S, and so norm involving, and comes to intentionality, S does A because phiing appears good for S. That's Aristotelian hyperintentional teleology. And that's how goodness is a cause, according to this guy. And it seems to me to be correct. Well, where does that leave us? Then again, there's Tolstoy. Remember what Levin said at, at the end? But his musings don't end quite where we left them. Which I thought was quite striking of Tolstoy. This is what we said at the beginning. If goodness has causes, it is not goodness. If it has effects, a reward, it is not goodness either. So goodness is outside the chain of cause and effect. And then he adds, yet I know it, and we all know it. Isn't that the greatest miracle of all? Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>